I think he has been uh, gone on the record of regretting ever having written it because it was never meant to be the threshold. It was meant to be an identification of, of, of a possible metric that should be utilized. Um, we've seen this before. We, um, we, we look at Canadian price ratios. The systems that we have in place have done a very good job for the Canadian taxpayer and for the Canadian patient of ensuring that Canadian prices are at the lowest within the world. And yet there is little recognition for that fact outside of our corporate parents who continuously say, you know, how are we going to continue to justify this? And increasingly we put in more and more restrictive programs uh, to ensure that we can get drugs to patients in Canada but don't run afoul of our corporate, uh, the corporate matrix. When you look at uh, the effectiveness of the PMPRB, I think, again, as taxpayers, as Canadians, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty robust program that's done a very effective job of ensuring that Canadian drug prices do not, do not increase. Um, that is their mandate, and they've been pretty good at it. And, uh, and perhaps we shouldn't necessarily find ways to fight against that and devote a lot of energy to that, but do a heck of a lot better job of communicating our value story uh, in relationship to all of this. Uh, we've seen similar slides. I think this puts us at 17th. Um, but certainly, you know, the, uh, the issue of societal value on medicines, Canada certainly ranks well behind most of the other industrial countries. And I think it was also referenced earlier this morning by uh, Mr. Williams that British Columbia is one of the uh, best markets in Canada for which you uh, to be treated for cancer. I can tell you uh, from first-hand experience that that is the first province that wants to speak to you. They will actively reach out. They want to work with you because their metric, and they publish on this, is that their patients with cancer in British Columbia actually survive longer than other jurisdictions, and yet it doesn't actually get any uptake in the Canadian environment. And maybe we need to do a better job of supporting the local Canadian research to support drives in other markets. Um, so for Canadian patients, who should be at the heart of the story? Well, certainly the taxpayer, and, and uh, we all look at our paycheck at the end of the day and uh, curse and moan about uh, how much goes away. And I think if you're a patient who, um, or, or a family member of someone who is struck with a, a disease such as cancer, everything comes down to cost. And so at that point in time, you know, the government and taxation and the cost of drugs, really the story spins away, but the onus and the responsibility is government. Our role is to do a better job of explaining what we've done in the interim. So, um, you know, you take a look at the value of innovation. This is the area of myeloma with which Celgene spends a lot of time. Um, you see a quantum and, f and enormous change in the median overall survival uh, just in the last five years, with the introduction of agents such as bortezomib from J&J, &J, uh, the image, which are part of the Celgene platform, this doubling in survival, and if we take a look, and again, we often get confused with medians, if you look at the real impact on an individualized patient, patients are living out 15 years on some of these agents, which used to be a five-year death sentence, and yet you rarely hear value from the payer in terms of the impact that that has had on the citizens within a given province. I think we've, talk, we've heard from Vince that you know, more inclusion of patient outcomes, return to work should be included as part of, as part of payer review systems. I think that's a, a, a metric and a start. But at the end of the day, if society doesn't value that fundamental change in health state, then the payers continue to do what they do right, and that is to protect the wallet of the, of the politician. Um, uh, just another statement from Brian Jury, head of the Myeloma Foundation. You know, in a quantum leap, uh, 93, 3% short of what a healthy person of a comparable age would expect. This message is being delivered by, you know, small companies, individual companies, I think, on a repeated basis. Uh, certainly, Celgene isn't the only company with, in, with uh, tremendous advancements and innovations, and probably everybody here has a drug within their portfolio. But somehow we're losing the ability, maybe because of the competitive nature of the industry, to consistently and effectively as a group communicate that, whereas I would argue the government is very singularly aligned on the one element of cost, value, and sustainability and are doing a better job with the public and with the politicians on ensuring that, we, we, uh, that they maintain that platform. Um, this is a slide that uh, was created, it's been used a couple times uh, through Biotech Canada presentations, um, but, uh, you know, and there's various iterations in, in development. 
I would suggest to you that as you look along the bottom axis with patient access that, um, and the, the green flag of, pa of patient access, that there are tremendous amounts of patient-centered value that is being delivered by this industry that we get zero value back when it comes to the point of access, so that, that magical point of a listing where everything is future-oriented. Um, there is no recognition for the extensive compassionate programs that companies make available from the time of uh, regulatory submission through the, through the increasing delays of uh, reimbursement um, submissions. I would hazard a guess that everybody in this room has hundreds of patients on various support programs, both pre-approvals and post-approvals. And we have not been able to, and I certainly, and we haven't certainly been able to leverage the ability of improving the health states of patients well in advance of the regulatory processes um, and gain value back for that on the end game. And if you were to take the, you know, the period of time post-genericization and add that back in as a total societal value, so the total contribution of a single medicine, if I was to think of aspirin as a good example, at one point in time when it was first introduced by Bayer, I believe, um, it might have been deemed expensive. Today, now, its utility uh, over the last 50 years, the relative societal value that that agent has brought uh, is enormous, and yet at the moment in time that industry has to pay, a or that government has to pay a premium for it, uh, it represents a significant problem. We have to find a better way as an industry to bridge that fundamental gap, otherwise I think we'll continue to stay in that lowest level, which is the cost paradigm. Um, I'll leave, uh, I'll leave that with you. One, one last thought, and um, uh, it's interesting, and, and uh, I'm disappointed that Mr. Williams had to run away because I was going to take him to task a little bit, but I'll throw this out as, a, um, as, a, uh, as food for thought. Uh, several uh, weeks ago, maybe three or four weeks ago, uh, after uh, a number of uh, requests for interviews by W5, um, uh, yours truly was, uh, was met by Victor Malarik at 7 a.m. in the morning in my parking lot heading into my office, cruising along fat, dumb, and happy, and, um, and uh, I'm, I'll be looking forward to seeing my saucer eyes uh, on camera on Saturday night because there's a W5 expose that will be coming out, and I think it's entitled Pills, Patients, and, and Who's Profiting from the Dying? And, uh, I would suggest to you that it is not going to be a uh, particularly flattering um, uh, news article. Uh, what I wanted to highlight, however, is that the week prior to uh, my, uh, my meeting, Mr. Malarik, um, it was a very pleasant meeting, um, Mr. Williams uh, sat down for an hour with W5 and did an hour-long interview of which Celgene was asked about and one of our drugs was asked about. And, and, you know, it, it might have provided um, some heads up and some insight if even within our own industry we had a competitive, competitive intelligence network that allowed for others like Biotech Canada to hear that there was an evolving story so that memberships could be prepared for possible uh, interviews such as that. And uh, I might have been avoided the pain trauma and looking like a complete doofus on Saturday night. Um, <laughs> One other point that I would make, uh, and I know, Joe, you want to get moving on, but I don't do anything in eight to ten minutes. Um, almost nothing. Um, I said almost nothing. Um, you, know, one of, you know, I reflected back on why I handled the, the, what I feel I handled the circumstance so poorly, and it was the fundamental issue that, um, you know, with my corporate parent, right, said this W-5, and my corporate parents in the States, said this is our 60 minutes. And, uh, and they're not stopping. There had been repeated requests. And the answer from my corporate parent was, it doesn't matter, you can't win, no point in having a discussion with them. They're going to say what they're going to say. And uh, our answer is, get their, get their questions in writing and we'll provide back an answer. Well, of course, that's not the way the media works. And so, um, even my own company, for which we believe strongly, and I believe strongly we have a tremendous value story to tell, and that there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of patients helped by the medicines just over the last five to ten years that Celgene has, um, I was hamstrung. And, uh, and so I think that's something that internally we need to do better. I, I would suggest that we could do that better as an industry as well, because I think there's a lot of good things. Thanks.